Good evening, and welcome to the Wall Exchange. Uh, my name is Janice Sarah, and I'm the director of the Peter Wall Institute for Advanced Studies here at the University of British Columbia, and a professor of law. The Wall Exchange is a series of downtown lectures sponsored by the Peter Wall Institute. The Institute itself is dedicated to advancing innovative and fundamental research that can generate new ideas, new thinking, and ultimately make important contributions to society. The Wall Exchange's objective is to allow us to engage in conversations about important and timely issues within our global society. And this evening promises exactly that. I'd like to thank the CBC and the Georgia Strait Magazine for co-sponsoring this event. The program this evening. Dr. Bruno Latour will speak for 45 minutes. Duncan Mukiu will then serve as moderator for a 45-minute question and answer period. Duncan McHugh has been a reporter for CBC News in Vancouver for 12 years. His award-winning current affairs piece is featured on CBC's The National. Before coming, becoming a journalist, Duncan studied English at the University of King's College, then law at UBC, and most recently was awarded a Knight Fellowship at Stanford University. Duncan is a Nishnanabi, a member of the Chippewa of the Georgina Island First Nation in Ontario. Thank you, Duncan, for agreeing uh, to serve this evening. Behind me on the screen, um, you'll find our hashtag and Twitter handle, and we invite you in the course of the lecture to um, send a question, or within two minutes after the end, and Duncan will be fielding these questions as well as from the mics at either end of the front row here. Now, to introduce Dr. Bruno Latour, who we are deeply honored to have speaking this evening. Dr. Latour is professor at Science Po in Paris, He's trained in philosophy and then anthropology, and he's been instrumental in the development of an anthology of science and technology. This field has had a direct impact on the philosophy of ecology and on an alternative definition of modernity. He's taught for many years in both Europe and in North America, and is author of a series of books exploring the consequences of science studies on different topics in the social sciences. Most recently published, and in English within the last month or two, is an inquiry into modes of existence, an anthropology of the moderns, which reflects his continued commitment to innovative thinking. It is a synthesis of 25 years of his analysis, but what he terms a provisional report, which will serve as the baseline text for a very interesting and innovative project involving integrated digital interface with the readers, allowing the broader community to contribute in a challenging but somewhat unfamiliar environment. Dr. Latour delivered the 2013 Gifford Lectures on Political Theology of Nature, and this year was awarded the prestigious Holberg Prize. Of tonight's lecture, War and Peace in an Age of Ecological Conflict, Dr. Latour has said, the most important geological force now operating on Earth is humans. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Bruno Latour. Thank you very much for inviting me. We, you have to read this cartoon because it's the only funny thing of my talk. <laughs> the rest, I'm afraid, will not be that um, funny. So I'm going to talk about uh, the notion of conflict. Um, and I think it's fair to say about that all the questions that I'm going to deal with you uh, tonight, we are divided. We are not only divided among different parties, different factions, religion, ideology, but also, I think, among ourselves. And I certainly feel such a division, and that's from the situation of internal conflict, so to speak, that I'm going to take the courage to address you tonight. What I'm going to do is to attempt at tracing with you some of the many lines of dissent that today constitute the warring parties whose disputes require new form of political attitudes, or rather of geopolitical attitude, provided you take the word geo in its etymological meaning, as you know, of Earth. As we will see, geopolitics is not about human politics overlaid on the static frame of the Earth, but politics about contradictory portions, visions, aspects of the Earth and its contending humans. 
Such is the new situation for which we don't seem to be very well equipped intellectually, and we try tonight to do. Let me start by the first front line. Consider the key issue, that of the fact about the anthropic, that is the human origin of the quickened pace of global climate variations. Such a fact, as you know, is not a divisive topic among climate scientists themselves, but is among those who really work to assemble data on that matter, since there is not much remaining controversy on the general picture. And uh, the soon-to-be-released fifth IPCC assessment report will confirm the existence of this consensus among the experts. And yet, there exist two immensely troubling dividing lines that have recently come to define the entire world view of many people, and not only, I think, in the developed world. In spite of a consensus of the IPCC expert, some scientists, well, I have to be careful here, few scientists say, many scientists, most often not themselves specialists of a domain that is not publishing in the journals where the IPCC colleagues published, wage against their colleagues a vigorous, some say vicious, attack in the name of science, capital S, and reason, capital R. They argue that this consensus is a sham that shows only the opinion, not the fact, of a powerful political scientific lobby, this is their word, addicted, at least this is the main claim, to computer modeling that have only an uncertain connection with the fact on the ground. And those dissenting voice argue that to take action based upon such a premature opinion would be an irrational decision. Mark the word decision, because that's the main focus on my talk. Now, that is said, it is not new. Scientific controversies and controversies about ecology and technology are as old as science and industry. What's new is the extent and intensity of a dispute where a segment of a scientific community, and we have to put this, this word in uh, score quote, score, uh, scare quote, sorry, acting in the name of skepticism, one of great virtue of science, debunk what other colleagues call objective certainty, another virtue of science. While in return, those colleagues accuse such a form of skepticism to be nothing more than a veil under which pseudoscientists, in order to protect industrial interest, hide the denial, or even worse, the negation of what is probably the best established fact in the natural history. Since Vancouver is the site of a remarkable desmog blog, come site, I don't need to belabor the issue. You can just go to the demos by James Hogan or read the book of my colleague Horace Kess, Merchants of Doubt. Many people have now followed those uh, issues very carefully. Where this controversy matter is that whatever the verdict, there is one thing that I, as a citizen, and probably most of you here tonight, cannot take for granted anymore. We cannot hide behind the verdict of a scientific community taken as a whole. The novelty is that we have to choose inside the disciplines, among the specialty, which segment of the specialty we will trust more than the other, and behind whom we will thrust our weight in the future. This means that we have to get used to a strange type of geopolitics, that is, the geopolitics of science in action by learning to navigate through the various maps of conflicting disciplines, paradigms, instruments, theories, and report. And here's a fabulous book by Paul Edward, a vast machine on the epistemic communities that have produced the knowledge about the climate uh, change. In effect, if you look at the figures visualizing the IPCC expert network, you see something like a parliament, and a pretty large parliament, of climate with about 4,000 representatives. This is the, a figure which is just out from a study we did in my lab, where you see all the authors of the three different work groups which have been producing the IPCC reports over the years. You see that it's a pretty large community, but it's not the scientific community taken in the abstract. The important point here is to realize that the decision about the facts of a matter cannot be delegated to a higher unified authority 
that we'd have done the choice instead. Controversies, no matter how spurious it might be, are no excuse to delay, delay the decision about which side represents our world better. In effect, we have to deal with those conflicts much like we have been used to do in the past with political parties. We don't believe nor trust them, but as Walter Lippmann said, we align ourselves behind those who might appear less partisan than the others, provided we are equipped, of course, with maps. This is where I draw the first dividing line. One side of me sees this destruction of the authority of a, of a final verdict upon the laws of nature as a catastrophe. Who will be our referee? And another side considers this situation as a great advance. We cannot any longer hide behind anyone else's decision. We have finally grown up as far as taking our destiny in our own hands is concerned. On one side of the border, it is the end of a rationalist dream. On the other, it's an extension of a great quest for a more, a more rational, or at least more reasonable kind of politics decision about what the world is. We cannot be, we cannot outsource them. But then there is a second reason why we are deeply divided about the question of the anthropic origin of climate change. As you know, the climate change is itself a word invented by certain Mr. Frank Lunst. I come back to that. It is that even once we have thrown our trust behind the IPCC last report, it will be out in a week, even once we have done that, we still don't know much what to do about it. Or if we do something, we remain fully aware that our endeavors are not at the relevant scale or at the relevant level for action. In that sense, even if most of you follow the report, and I assume that this is the case in the greenest city of Vancouver <laughs> and in probably a liberal audience like here, you are nonetheless all climato-skeptic. Since this knowledge, even if it's widely shared, does not trigger as much action as necessary. As the Chinese proverbs say, to know and not to, and not to act is not to know. What does a reader of a review article on the link between smoking and lung cancer really knows about this very fact if he's reading while smoking a cigar? Is it not fair to say that he knows this connection only vaguely? In a similar way, there is a form of practical climato-skepticism very different from the cognitive one. Even though I decided to align myself behind the IPCC report, which is not the same as believing in it, belief is not in question here, I feel very much that I am a skeptic, since I don't know what to do about it, apart from a few pathetic gestures like sorting my rubbish and limiting my carbon footprint by coming to Vancouver, for instance, and feeling guilty about it, but that's about it. <laughs> I act as a climato skeptic, or rather because of his state of relative indecision, I share with those people the attitude that I represent, that represent, I think, most of the developed world right now. And I'm sorry to say that it includes Canada, to the great disappointment of Europeans. And that could be called climato quietism. Quietism in theology is a sort of a layback attitude that somehow, without doing anything much, God will take care of your salvation. So I think we are all climate quietist. I don't know the word in English. This first dividing line about the anthropic origin of climate change, and a division which has been exploited, of course, by very disreputable lobbies, could have been rather easier to stitch back together, but for another source of dispute, this time even more troubling, about what we may expect from science and from its complex institutional machinery of fact-making. And I know that's a tricky point, which in my experience always trigger pretty strong passions. The usual solution when a group of people encounters a new and dangerous issue, an epidemic, a pollution, a depression, a 
piece of news, like learning that a dictator has gas most of his, a lot of his uh, citizen, is to try to get the facts right first, and only then to formulate a policy about it. If a fact of a matter cannot be readily launched, some research programs have to be launched. And the group mobilized by the issue is to wait for the result to come up. If there is a controversy about the data, then wait for the closure of the dispute. That's the common sense view. First, an agreement about the fact, which by nature, if they are objective, are one. I mean, that's the idea. This is why they are able to bend together in agreement those who would disagree. Second, many disagreements about policy, since those are also by nature based on multiple and irreconcilable, irreconcilable values. In such a common sense view, facts divide only the expert and only for the time left for the research to close down. So what is expected is unity and final closure of that fact, followed by discord, and then attempt at closure about policy by compromise, discord, consensus, vote, or facts do not divide. That's the point, facts do not divide, except provisionally. Policies and values always do, but only for a time, provided an institution has taken charge of the closure. The first closure is objective and final. The second is somewhat makeshift. More importantly, the first closure is based on the nature of things themselves. And only the second may be rightly called a decision. And if the word decision is applied on the first closure, that of fact, this is considered as an illegitimate and arbitrary intrusion of politics into science. I've tried to summarize as clearly as I could the rationalist ideal of a division of labor between science and politics. But the fascinating paradox is that if such a view of rationalism had been applied on our topic, then there should be no climate controversy. Since in our case, the consensus of the scientific community had indeed been reached long ago, we should bow, by now have on, on entered a normal discord about policies. Today, the emphasis should entirely be be on how to reach some compromise about how to deal with the issues among dissenting parties, all having legitimate dissenting interest. We would have progressed as quickly as possible from step one, fact closure, towards step two, policy closure. And yet, we have witnessed exactly the opposite move. That is, a constant regression from the urge to quick action to inaction, from urgency to delay, from climate certainty to climate quietism, from a declaration of war, of a state or rather a state of emergency, to a call for appeasement. Every year, while the facts have accumulated at an ever-expanding speed, the general doubt about the urgency and nature of acting on the basis of them has constantly decreased. The unanimity that had seemed possible at the time of Reagan, Bush I, or Clinton, seems impossible at the time of Copenhagen 2009, or probably Paris 2015. What has happened? Many things, for sure. But what conceptual one concern here uh, sorry, what conceptual one concerns us here tonight? The rationalist theory of action is a fantasy. Or rather, it becomes a fantasy when it applies to a life connection between your own action and what you are talking about or trying to know. Let me show you how we may handle this difficult point. There is a traditional division in philosophy between statements about natural phenomena, it makes no difference to them that you know them or not, and social phenomena, to know them is to modify them somewhat. And I put, of course, natural and social 
in scare quotes. John Searle, as you know, has written a whole book about this division. A statement about the boiling point of water has no influence on water. Why the statement, provided you have the right authority, by a bank about the worth of a dollar bill does define how much it's worth. One is called a constitutive and the other is called a performative. The words don't matter here. This is why for any action that concern us in daily occurrence, unfortunately, we never, I insist, we never follow the rationalist theory of action. I'm asking you, who among you possessed all the facts of a matter before deciding to marry? <laughs> to have children, to invest, to move to Vancouver, to plant a garden, to vote for a party. We are all aware that acting means taking risks and making bets. This does not mean that all those decisions were arbitrary, since you acted on feelings, on many subtle cues, pointers, taste, warning, that depended on your having rendered yourself sensitive to a multitude of unconnected events and tiny perceptions. And this doesn't mean that you took your decision without knowledge either. Rather, it means that they had not been made after a full knowledge had been obtained and consensus reached. But it's fair to say that once the decision had begun to take effect, a lot of new knowledge has been obtained and many rectifying steps have been taken along the way. This is common sense. The only point I wish to make is that far from following the pattern knowledge and closure first, then policy, all our decisions are made without waiting for complete closure. The only closure, as Jean-Paul Sartre could have said, is when clods of earth are thrown by our friends on our coffin, which is, of course, a different thing altogether. So for all the daily decisions we take, we should say that they neither follow undisputable fact. Actually, in that case, there would be no decision because it would be a simple deduction from the knowledge. Nor are they whimsical, arbitrary choices, as if we had been throwing a dice to decide whom we should marry or what investment to make. Those statements are entering a zone that is based on what I am tempted to call Objective, choice-triggering fact. There exist undisputable statements, as the name indicates, close any dispute, period. They are called apodictic. And then there are facts that even though they are objective, do not close all discussion, but have to be relayed by many disputed choices, some of which will trigger more accurate and objective data or not. Those are not followed by a period. They are not undisputable. They are followed, so to speak, by a column. Discussion begins. To see how this somehow, somehow innocuous distinction may throw some light on our question, we may think of an event which is really mentioned when we talk about ecological debate and which is an intermediary situation between the daily occurrences and geopolitics. Take, for instance, the Cold War nuclear buildup. None of the lobbies that today are fiercely combating climate science because it is still too incomplete and inaccurate to take action would have complained in the 1950s about the lack of quality of the intelligence of the government had about the Soviet threat. That's a perfect case where action and knowledge proceed in parallel and not in succession, and reach, as you know, bark proportion until the threat all but disappeared. Now, I'm asking you, project the pattern of a present climate controversy over the Cold War nuclear buildup and try to see what the rationalist theory of action would have done to handle this past situation. Imagine that think tanks of various persuasion would have asked the CIA first to provide an undisputed proof 
that the Soviet were to attack. Then, and only then, proportionate answer could be devised. And of course, as long as the proof would not have been well ascertained, action should have been delayed. That's the great virtue of a rationalist view. If action begins only after full knowledge has been acquired, then any doubt, any skepticism is enough to block policy and to delay action. That is exactly why Mr. Lunz, a great rationalist certainly, introduced into the Republican talking points the necessity of doubting climate data when he wrote many years ago, should the public come to believe that the scientific issues are settled, their views about global warming will change accordingly. Therefore, we need to continue to make the lack of scientific certainty a primary issue. Imagine another Mr. Lunz in the 1950. He would have introduced quite a spoke in the wheels of the great chariots of war. The lack of scientific certainty about the Soviet threat will have paralyzed action. Imagine, no nuclear buildup, no threat of annihilation. We would have saved thousands, billions of dollars. Or, that's also a plausible outcome, because the USA would have been paralyzed by inaction, we would all be ruled, yes, even here in Vancouver, from Mr. Putin's office under the red star flag in the Kremlin. Of course, you could say that if the Cold War case, the rationalist scheme is clearly inapplicable, it is because first, we deal here with American and Russian and not with facts of nature. We are thus dealing with performative statement and not constative statement. And second, that in the case of the Soviets, we were at war with them. And as we all know, the first casualty of war is truth. Well, that's precisely why I choose this example. First, it could well happen that the real nature of ecological conflicts implies performative statement. And second, we might very well be in a situation of war. That's the really tricky part of my lecture. It happens that what is in dispute, remember the anthropic origin of a quicker path of global variation, sits exactly between the two types of statements that I mentioned earlier. It is a constative statement of fact about sets of action for which those who speak are also the main agent, not to say the culprits. That's the heart of the dispute and why the issue is so divisive. If we were talking about a fact of a matter in the traditional sense, that is, bearing on agents that are indifferent to our knowledge and action about them, then the rationalist theory of action could obtain. Let us wait for closure, and then we will define policies at our leisure. But if we are dealing with a fact that is more like the Cold War nuclear buildup, that is, about agents that are far from indifferent to our action, and that seem to react pretty quickly to what we do, what we have done, what we will do, then to apply the rationalist scheme on such a situation is just as silly, not to say criminal, as to wait for the Soviet to have crossed the Bering Strait before taking action. To make myself completely clear, let me take one of those trivial examples beloved by analytical philosopher. You are in a bus, and you see that a rather corpulent, distracted man is going to choose a seat where there is a little cat in a pink basket, which is going to be squeezed flat <laughs> if a man carries out his action. It would be ludicrous of you to wait for the meowing little kitty before telling the man. <laughs> However, if you state there is a cat in a basket on the seat. Is it a constative or is it a performative statement? Note that the argument does not depend on the tone. 
if you say there is a cat in the basket, there is a cat on the basket, there is a cat on the basket, it makes no difference to the argument. <laughs> on the one hand, such a statement is certainly as accurate and objective as one wishes to be. It describes a state of affairs, there is a cat in the basket. But it's just as clearly a warning directed at shifting a course of action. Thus, it happily mixes objective accuracy and an urgent call. Plus, of course, a value statement. You don't like to have little cat being squeezed by big tummies. <laughs> but more interestingly, it will also be heard by the man in the same mixed register being understood at once as a call for attention, for information, and for remedial action. Even if you had stated in the utmost matter of factual tone, there is a cat on the map, it will be taken by him as a pointer directing attention toward a whole set of successive action. We are here clearly dealing with a case of choice triggering fact, crossing the fact value distinction. That's what I call elsewhere matters of concern and not matters of fact. The point here is that the classical distinction between facts and values is overlaid upon a distinction between natural entities, those about which we may speak from afar, and a dis dispassionate, disinterested tone, and social situation, those inside which we are thoroughly embedded because we are part of a feedback mechanism we attempt and describing and as you know, this division itself is what was supposed to distinguish natural sciences from the social one. The latter having no real objectivity because of the involvement of a scientist in the making of the object that we are studying. Now, here's the new conundrum. You may speak in a disengaged and dispassionate way of a boiling point of water, but can you speak in a disengaged and dispassionate way of the objective measurement that industrial civilization has passed the 400 ppm of CO2 in the atmosphere in the spring of 2013? This is a, a page from Le Monde and the translation on the left. So I'm asking you, is this statement like, more like water boils at 100 degrees? or like there is a cat on the seat, or the reds are coming. That's where the whole distinction between fact and value is falling apart. And this is also why those who are most worried and passionate about the objective statement are also the ones who are producing the objective fact. This is an amazing case from Charles Keeling, with the one who has monitored the CO2 for many years in uh, Hawaii. And he has written this amazing book, Rewards and Penalties of Monitoring the Earth, a long article, almost a book size, about the passion he had to put in order to maintain this monitoring station against the opinion of everybody, including many of the scientists, actually. So it seems that these scientists, the ones who are supposed to be more dispassionate and disinterested, behave vis-à-vis -vis those facts, just as the bus passenger in my trivial example of a man and the cat. It's not the tone that counts. It's the shift in the very character of a statement. Not one uttered by an indifferent and disinterested voice speaking about something distant and indifferent, but the voice of someone fully engaged in a feedback loop with other agencies which themselves show a distinct sensitivity about what we do to them. It's not that those climatologists are not objective, even though this is just what the other party accuse them to be, since they are not disinterested enough. It's that they are talking about events of which they, and all of you, are parts and parcels, just as used to be the case for so-called social situation in the recent past. Such is the completely unexpected situation that have been captured in the beautiful dispute around the Anthropocene. This is a, um, a diagram from the Stefan 
paper in 2011, where you see the footprint of humans and the little uh, quadrilater at the end, at the bottom, is, uh, if you can read it, what, where we were in 1950s, which is about very small. The great acceleration, as they call it, dates from, I'm sorry to say about the time I was born. So I, my little uh, guilt, you understand, is coming from the fact that when I was born, there was this little quadrilateral, and now I'm old, almost retired, and this is what, not me, of course, a human as a sort of global assembly, which is not assembled, that's precisely the point. <laughs> For any course of action, and that's what the Anthropocene says, it has become highly uncertain where we are considering human or non-human agency at work. And that's why the non-human human dispute in sociology of science has been so important over the years. It's just as impossible to decide on which side you are as when you follow the path of the Möbius strip with your finger, which means that, on Earth at least, the old distinction, well, not so old in the end, it's quite new, between natural and social factors has become moot. But of course, this is just the point where lies the most intense dispute. And what characterizes for every one of us the defining moment? Are we not or are we living at the time of the Anthropocene? There is no way to decide this question on objective ground. Since it's precisely the question of what an objective ground is that, I insist, objective and ground are at stake. The fight is a radical one. It pits against one another those who say, of course now, we should behave like normal humans inside a natural frame that might react a bit more surprisingly than expected but about which the normal rationalist sphere of action fully applies. The agents about which we are dealing with are so distant, are so unconcerned by action, that we should first get the fact of the matter as dispassionately as we can, and then it will be time to argue about policy. And those who say, too late, we are talking objectively and thus passionately about matters which are so little distant from us and so little indifferent to what we do that we are engaged in a frightening and somewhat frenetic feedback loop while remaining in deep ignorance about the exact mechanism of their reaction as well about policy. To sum up, business as usual on one side, subversion on the other. Or as I sketched the scene elsewhere, on one side, humans, and on the other, earthbound. Don't rush to take your side. More to come. <laughs> the reason to delay a bit the decision on choosing your camp is that we have to understand that what is implied by the very notion of decision that I've used so far. This will lead us to the third and final dividing line. It's traditional in political philosophy to contrast war and what I would call policing or peacemaking operation, if you want. For instance, if a burglar is breaking in your neighbor's house, there is no controversy over values and procedures you call the police. It might be difficult to get the culprit, but nobody discusses the legitimate ground of the police to act. The overall situation has been settled by a referee an arbiter, in this case, the state. But things are entirely different in the case of war, for instance, civil war. Then the decision on who is the legitimate authority is precisely what is to be tried out through some decisive encounter. In this case, there is no arbiter, no referee. And that doesn't mean that it's a gory version. There is no blood necessarily there. The only point is the presence or the absence of referee. And I remind you of a quote by Carl Schmitt, very famous exponent of his argument. The political en enemy need not be morally evil or aesthetically ugly. The point is that this dispute can neither be decided by a previously determined general norm 
nor by the judgment of a disinterested, disinterested and therefore neutral third party. The point I want to introduce here is that when people turn to nature and speak about nature or invoke natural laws, they are never really at war with anybody. Of course, they meet people who disagree, but those are not technically or legally their enemies. They are simply more or less irrational people. Do you see the difference? When you engage in a police operation, you act in the name of a higher authority that has already settled the conflict, and you merely play the role of an instrument of punishment. But when you are at war, it's only through a force of encounter that the authority you have or you don't have will be decided, depending whether you win or lose. Now, I'm going to ask you the toughest question of all, the really divisive one. Do you consider that those who are on the opposite sides of you in the ecological issue in which you are engaged, and that might be direct or indirectly, are those adversary, if you want, are they irrational beings that should be resisted? Discipline, maybe punished, or at least enlightened or re-educated. That is, do you believe that your commitment is to carry a police or a peacemaking operation of some sort in the name of a higher authority? Or do you consider that they are your enemies? That is, they have to be one, one other through a trial the outcome of which is unknown as long as you have not succeeded. That is, that neither of you nor them can delegate to some superior and prior instant the task of referring the dispute. Many of you might not see this as a divisive question, but I'm sorry to say it, maybe for the wrong reason. You might have been blinded to it by the habit to believe when dealing with issues involving nature, especially nature known by science, that whenever you invoke it and its law, agreement will necessarily ensue. To the point that they are not seen as conflict. That's a problem, there is no conflict. Since every side consider that once nature has spoken, the case is closed. It's just a question of policing the remaining dissenters. There is a sort of use naturalism that is implicit in all sides of ecological disputes. And the same people who would deride the papacy for invoking natural law to give its decrees a solid foundation will not hesitate a minute to use what science tells us to decide anything from the absurdity of a cap and trade bill to the urgent necessity of decarboning the industry from saving the biodiversity of the planet, etc. The problem with such a belief is that it means that there is no politics involved in ecological conflicts, only a question of police. Everything unfolds as if there existed somewhere, some instance, with the capacity and authority of a quasi-state, what could be called the state of nature to settle the dispute. Strangely enough, as I have shown in Politics of Nature, ecology has always suffered from a lack and not from an excess of politicization. Only those who have enemies do politics. Only those who are not treating the adversary as irrational or mad or archaic people may begin to equip themselves to win a battle. Why insisting so much on declaring a war as if we didn't have enough source of conflict, you might object. What is the gain in losing the great arbiters of the laws of nature, this final referee who has protected us against the vagaries of politics and internal strife? Has not the appeal to nature known by science been the only protection against generalized conflicts? We might disagree on anything, 
but at least the boiling point of water stabilized me. Period. Yes, I know. And I'm myself divided on this question. But it is exactly this common sense solution that seems to have run out of steam when dealing with climate dispute. The objective statement, industrial civilization has passed the 400 ppm of CO2 threshold in spring 2013, directs toward either action or inaction, which are fully political, not in the sense of being practical or mobilizing heads of state, but because they amount to a kind, there is no other word, of civil war. Sides have to be taken. Decisions have to be made. Police or politics, you have to choose. The reason why it's so important to answer my question, do you fight against enemy or simply against irrational people, is that the capacity of natural laws to unify is entirely gone. You might still invoke science, capital S, as one and indivisible, but the truth is that they are multiple. The disciplines are multiple, infinitely divisible. Nature used to be one when we were dealing with a highly simplified version of its components. Galilean object, not Darwinian organism. That worked for Mars, not for the Earth. Today, any look at the multiplicity of agency mobilized in any scientific papers about climate will show that the unity of science has always been wishful thinking. The sheer difficulty of modeling the Earth climate on a computer will bear witness that the objectivity of science cannot be confused with the unity of its decrees. The former domain of nature is neither harmonious nor unified, nor is it outside. And the situation is even worse, of course, on the side of a formal social domain. There is no unity to be expected in invoking the interest of a human race. The sheer diversity of interest and situation the vertiginous differences in wealth and power, the multiplicity of cultures and ways of relating to the soil forbid any appeal to a universal human interest that will trigger some assent. Contrary to a superficial reading, the term Anthropocene does not mean the great superior fusion of a unified nature and a unified human, as if the two could somehow live harmoniously with one another but the mind-boggling, shattering, and dissemination of its components. What used to be human and what used to be natural are so mixed up that to get back to a sense of order, one has to do politics all over again. Politics understood, that is, as the progressive composition of a common word. And the word is not common yet. It has to be composed bit by bit, issue by issue. And for that, there is no overall master plan, because there is no master. That's why geopolitics take another dimension altogether. It's not politics inside a stable frame, the Holocene, but could be appealed to and relied upon in the case of emergency. But it is, so to speak, politics all the way down, including about the very component of what the old gay or Gaia are made of. Let me conclude. I've attempted to trace in front of you, or maybe to draw inside yourselves, three lines of descent that, in my view, make up an important part of political ecology, but are not often underlined enough. So strong is the idea that the nostalgia, rather, but when nature enters the scene, immediately comes to mind a whole set of global, unified, totalizing, even spherical image. This is the sort of thing that you can get from the, the sort of association of nature and globe. Orbis terrarum, sive sphaira, sive deus, sive natura, which is from Peter Sloterdijk. To counteract this attitude, I've asked you to feel both sides of a free following geopolitical struggle. First, when dealing with a climate controversy, do you expect the scientific community to come to a final agreement? Or are you ready to take upon yourself to decide which kind of discipline 
and which scientist you have to line yourself behind. To put it in other words, science, capital S, are scientists and the fact-making institution. It is a dividing line. Second, are the statements about ecological conflict more like the boiling point of water or more like the Cold War threat? In other words, are we dealing with a word made of distant matters of fact a word composed of highly reactive matters of concern. This too divides sharply, since those on both sides of a border literally do not inhabit the same world. To put it too starkly, some are readying themselves to live as earthbound in the Anthropocene and others to remain human in the Holocene. They don't live in the same world. Third, do you, act, do you act as the legitimate instrument of a higher authority that has already settled the issue? Or do you accept to have enemies who would win if you fight them during an encounter for which there is no higher arbiter? In other words, is there some tribunal of history to decide the issue or not? In other words, are we at war with one another? or just in the usual normal disagreement that could be settled by appealing to some sort of universal state of nature, USN, which is neither the UN or the USA. <laughs> in drawing these lines, in insisting so much on division and war, how I wish to be wrong. Can you imagine how marvelous life would be if we were to learn from the IPCC report next week that they had been mistaken all along and that the temperature would not increase as much as we had expected. How relaxing it would be to learn that geoengineering is gearing to take care of the remaining problems and engulf the planet in a safer state of control. How delightful it will be to believe in the progress of science and reason, in the prolongation of the frontier spirit, all the way to the fully modernized Earth and beyond, to Mars, to the Moon, maybe further to the stars. How charming it will be to believe again in the endless progress of modernization and terraforming, in the globe of reason encircling the blue planet. I could retire happily nursing the same dreams we shared when I was a little kid, eyes upward, trying to detect the blinking sign of Sputnik. Modern again, human again. Eyes wide shut, far away from planet Earth, in the hypnotic utopia of the past. Then we would not have to worry about the angel of geostory. Thank you very much. There's a cat on your seat. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Bruno Latour. Another round of applause. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, 
such a pleasure to, to welcome you here to Vancouver and the, and the traditional territory of the Coast Salish people. Um, what I've got here is an iPad. I'm just going to be checking my Facebook every once in a while, uh, so if you don't mind. Um, what, I, <laughs> what I've got is uh, an iPad here with uh, Twitter. And so if anybody wants to uh, tweet a question to us, I'll be here kind of checking this every once in a while. So if I, if I appear like I'm not paying attention, it's not, it's, I'm fascinated by Twitter. Um, and then we're going to encourage people to come up to the mics. And I, boy, it's hard for me to see. There's, yeah. So if people have questions, come on up. Uh, and you can start coming up right now, and we'll just work our way through the questions. Um, I'm going to start off, though. There we go. There's a light. That helps a lot. Uh, let me start off with one, one quick one of my own. Uh, you talked about living earthbound in the age of the Anthropocene. What does that look like? Sorry? What does living earthbound in the age of the Anthropocene look like? <laughs> I'm wrestling with that. Well, earthbound is a way to use uh, another expression, it could be Terrians. But is, I mean, you know, if you have, uh, as I understand, a connection with uh, First Nation, you know that there are many ways of being bound to the earth which are not connected to the idea that the humans, I mean, the humans were supposed to be bound to the earth, but it's not in integrated in their name, so to speak, except if you remember that the word human comes from humus, which is the same word as soil. So, um, but that's a tradition which has been some sort of lost in what we call humanism, and of course it's pretty dangerous to be beyond humanism, so it's a tricky uh, question to be um, how much of a human's um, how much of a definition of humans is associated to the being of a soil. And that's, of course, something for which the uh, experience of First Nation and the large literature in anthropology uh, is so interesting because there are many, many ways of inhabiting the earth which are not the ones which have been developed uh, uh, in industrial uh, societies, so to speak. So. I guess that uh, the dispute between humans and earthbound uh, is uh, ha on one side a sort of simplified version of what it is to be a human and another a proliferation of ways and experience and uh, experiments in what it is to be bound to a soil which have been somewhat pushed aside as being archaic or irrational or symbolic and not real and which we listen to it very differently now at the time of the Anthropocene because we are all interested in other ways of inhabiting the Earth because the Earth is actually a new Earth. It's no longer the same Earth as before. So we live in the time of a discovery, basically. I mean, it's the same very much back to the 16th century, so to speak. Not the discovery of a new Earth in the sense of extension, but a new Earth in the sense of intensity. And suddenly we realize that the Earth is doing all sorts of other things. And um, I think there is a reappraisal in very practical terms of what was before part of a, a folklore or part of the anthropological literature and a topic you might be interested in. Good, thank you. So we've got one question here. Uh, go ahead, sir. Hello, my name is Corky Day, and I would like to ask if until we decide on which sides of all of these lines we are. Until that time, should we use David Suzuki's precautionary principle and try to have as little effect on the earth that could be damaging? Yes, well, the Suzuki has chosen his side. <laughs> and I think it's good. I mean, uh, the, 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 the sides which I would... Uh, sort of sympathize with, uh, but it's a, it's a choice. It's not, the, it, this decision, the precautionary principle, as you know, and also in legal uh, sphere, is uh, one of a very, very tense source of conflict. Actually, it is the geological issue as far as international law is concerned, a bone of contention between America, and USA, especially the USA and, and Europe. So to choose the precautionary principle He's having, he's a very great uh, and important decision. And I think it's, it, it is a good decision. But it cannot be, the point I made is that it, it's not a decision made about in the name of a higher authority. That's the point. 
I want to make it just in the name of a very important political, a trace of political uh, line which has to be accepted as being political and not as just a rational decision. I hope I, this is an answer. This Good. Is, we, we, yeah. thanks. Thanks very much. And then we've got another question over here on this mic. Hello. Um, thanks for the talk. Um, my friend and I earlier at a bar were talking about this concept in law, modified objectivity, that's a bit of a, a face-saving concept. Uh, you had Don't speak so fast. Sorry. Sure, sorry. Um, modified objectivity in law. Um, yes. That you, would, you had this uh, objective view of things, but you modify given new uh, information. And um, I guess my question is um, uh, sort of uh, the political aspects of law. Uh, and it, it, because you kept uh, drawing the distinction between war and, and, and there being a, a state and resolution and peace, there is a, um, a, a woman getting a divorce. Uh, her case from BC has gone to the Supreme Court of Canada. Uh, where the argument against, uh, I suppose, tri trial lawyers is that the $3,600 filing fee uh, you know, makes it uh, a barrier to justice for the middle class, not just the poor. And there is a civil resolution tribunal uh, being established in BC, which is more of a, uh, there is an arbiter, but there is no appeal in that process. So I guess I want to bring you to making some dis decisive statements, perhaps, uh, as to the function of law uh, you know, uh, <laughs> in, in the whole thing, and then, okay. Well, no, this is an impo I mean, of course, I mentioned Schmidt, so um, the question of philosophy of law is essential here. The, the, the point that even in the example you mentioned, which I'm not sure I, I followed, but is about, uh, there, there is no, this, there is somewhere a procedure for which there is a state behind. They are, of course, lawyers dispute. I mean, this is, they are paid for that. So it's not a question of agreement. It's that it, even if there is a dispute, it's considered as um, police, policing. Now, of course, I'm not interested here in law. I did a book on law, by the way, on this one of the French Supreme Court, but that's not the object here. When we are dealing in, uh, with an ecological question, the tendency is to say, we have the law and the state behind, which jokingly I call the state of nature, capital S, capital N, which of course is never considered as a political issue. It, it's in the background, it's supposed to be. Once nature has spoken, then agreement will follow. So it's transporting into the civil society a model which is actually never clearly political and never clearly scientific. And that's why I think that it has paralyzed action in ecology, not in, in the science, ecology as a science of ecosystem, but in political ecology, because basically you think that once you have defined what nature is, then the rest of the politics will follow. We know what nature is, and that's why the precautionary principle is so important, because precautionary principle precisely says the opposite. The absence of scientific certainty should not stop uh, action. So law is there, of course, but what I'm talking about, the laws of nature, and that's where the, 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 the metaphor, should, the sort of parallel should be followed, is there an arbiter for the laws of nature? Of course you would say this is silly because the laws of nature is what nature is. Well then, we should have had no con controversy in the climate case because we should have agreed because there is no controversy. And yet there is. The certainty does not carry action. So there is something which is uh, troubling in this, uh, in, in this the case of climate controversy which I think make us modify quite a lot what we expect from the sciences. This is the second dividing line. But to talk about law, we would need more time and it would be another topic. Good. Thanks very much for your question. And another one at that mic, I believe. Go ahead. Thank you very much. You've spoken in your talk about the need for a politics, for a progressive creation of a common world, but you noted that the world is not yet common, and my question relates 
to that point. Because it seems to me that this politics is the central task. If we choose to be as earthlings in the Anthropocene rather than humans in the Holocene, as you noted. And I'd like to ask what sorts of concepts we might mobilize, what sorts of practices those might lead to, given the pitfalls of the concept of the commons, whether it be the Ostrom notion of the commons, which is enabling yet has certain exclusionary pitfalls, or a singular notion of the commons with all of the potential for eco-fascism that that might imply. Um, it might be that something like being in common, as Jean-Luc Nancy has argued, is a way forward. I don't know the answer. I realize that's a, a big question, but I would, love, <laughs> I would love to hear your thoughts. I'm afraid I don't know enough of the question either. The best would be the, this beautiful book on the, on, on the common ground, uh, on the American uh, First Nation discussion with the French and the English at the time of the 17th century, which is uh, nothing is common in the common world precisely. Uh, so common world, the progressive composition of a common world means, in, in my view, first, and you're right to, to raise the question, uh, the fact that we are not in the situation where we dispute among humans because we have different ideologies and interests, but when there is the dispute, there is something which is undisputed, which is the background and the certainties of the laws of nature. So we have dispute here, and we know that everybody has different views on anything, but at least there is somewhere outside of a dispute what can make us agree, which is basically the natural framework. So my point is precisely that this is what, so there is a common word on science and an uncommon word as far as politics is concerned. And the ecological conflict is precisely that what was the decor, what was the the, the sort of frame is on, on the stage, I mean, literally. This is why we, the last image I show is the play we, we, we did together with a f group of friends, precisely showing that the decor is becoming the actor. So that's my main point here. The rest, how do we compose a common word? That would be, um, I, I don't have the answer to your question. The point is what it is to begin to build when there is no appeal, no referee, no court of appeal, so to speak, when you could turn out of a dispute of human and say, look, you dispute, but the, out there, the framework is common and unifying you, whatever you do. Well, this is not true. We are disunited as human, and we are disunited as when we talk about the outside natural framework, because it's no longer a framework, because we are in the Anthropocene. So the question of what is the common, your very good question, is precisely reopened by the Anthropocene, because we now we have to, in to integrate all of the element of the decor, which are now all sort of agencies which have their own movement and their own history. It's in one word as if historicity has shifted from the humans to nature. If I had the answer to your question, I would do much better. <laughs> I would feel much better. <laughs> but I don't. What I know is that the common has to be composed. And that includes the sciences. And that's what is the key interesting element in the dispute around climate science. But I wish I could answer your question. Is that good enough? Did you get your answer to your question? No, I can't. Or I'll ask up? again. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta... <laughs> it's so she's, she's it's the topic though. of your yeah, next book. Oh, she, she's still there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was turning to the other one, hopefully, okay, right. uh, hoping but, she had let's, disappeared. Let's just, just to encourage the tweeters here, the, 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 and, and I'll get to you, sir. Um, but but we've got, if, if, you want, if you have a question that you want to uh, want me to read out, uh, hashtag WallX is, is where, we're, where, we're, uh, where you can... Does this thing really work? It you? does work, yeah, it's pretty neat. Oh. Um, I'll read one for you. Uh, from uh, WalkBB, is the absence of a referee not war in the perhaps utopian visions of anarchy for the earthbound? Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. 
That's, that's why you're over there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if anarchy means that there is no state of nature there to allocate the dispute and transform all the conflict into police operation, it is a state of anarchy. And I think it's a very interesting uh, comment. Yes. Good. Go ahead, sir. Very good talk, sir. Um, my name is Robert Young. I've spent 25 years working on environmental technologies and uh, a lifetime studying uh, nature. Uh, I have a degree in geography, which is a study pretty much of everything. And uh, I've come to the conclusion, and, and I, I also spend time in the uh, geosciences uh, mining, the mining field. Um, and there's a lot of mining uh, uh, metals such as energy metals, uh, environmental metals, uh, uh, critical metals. It's not all bad metals. Um, I don't but what, what, I, what I'm bringing up here is I'm constantly talking to geologists who think they know what's happening. But uh, bottom line is most of them are quite ignorant. I remember t talking to one fellow uh, who, you know, they, they, they only sort of remember what they learned in university, uh, and they weren't even properly trained in university to understand uh, climate change, et cetera, et cetera. And I remember having a discussion with this one guy, and he said, Robert, uh, yes, we have messed with Mother Nature a bit, and yes, uh, uh, the world has a bit of a rash, and I said, but Steve, the world's not supposed to have a rash. But what I should, you know, what, what I, what I, I never came across uh, a book to, uh, at the level of um, James Lovelock, uh, The Vanishing Face of Gaia. Until people read a book like that, ideally that book, uh, I don't think they can even begin to understand how the many parts of uh, uh, Gaia work and how Mother Nature is going to be taking us behind the barn. She doesn't give a damn whether or not uh, we uh, have an arbiter or uh, uh, you know a, a judge or whatever. We're messing with her biosphere, and and. And you know, was there a question for Dr. Latour? Well, my question would be about Gaia and, and your interest personally in, in the issues of global warming. Well, I'm a great fan of Lovelock. Actually, I've written a lot on Lovelock. And um, one of the interesting elements that you brought in here by bringing Lovelock and his book especially, um, and also the revenge of Gaia, is this the one you mentioned? Yes. Uh, is of course that the metaphor, and it's clearly a metaphor in Lovelock's book, he says so, is an interesting element of a war of which I mentioned, which is a war, strange type of war, because you can't win. If you win, you lose, and if you lose, you lose. So it's an asymmetric uh, war. So in terms of geopolitics, Lovelock is absolutely essential. I agree with you. But I'm not sure that the way uh, you transform the argument of Lovelock by saying then, then mother nature um, is um, the other party to the conflict is uh, the good way to put it because it's not mother's nature against the humans. It's, the humans are not unified either. There are lots of many ways, this is the first question, there are many ways of being humans and they don't have the same interests and they don't have the same responsibility they don't have the same uh, uh, carbon footprint, they don't have the same history, they don't have the same technology and so on. I mean, things you certainly know if you have been in the industry and in, the, in geography. So uh, there is a great danger of retransforming this uh, argument of Lovelock into us, the humans, against her. And uh, I think that's where the Anthropocene is an interesting concept, because precisely it's a Mibius trip. You never know exactly when you are dealing with one. If you, do, if you deal with nitrogen, where are you? Are you in the plant, in the sense of vegetable, or are you in the plant, in the sense of industry? This is very uncertain. And we should not 
And I think that's, that's the danger of using uh, Lovelock as a unified Gaia. And actually, my reading of Lovelock, I've written a lot on that, is precisely that even in, in, in Lovelock, it's not unified. Gaia is not one. It's not one system. It, it's precisely a multiplicity of entities, the connection of which has to be composed. And of course, some of the connection has been made by uh, Lovelock with great uh, success. But it's not, uh, a, 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 even though you use the metaphor, often a cybernetic system, if you want. Because that would be, again, pit the humans against nature in the very traditional definition. Well, I, when I read it, I, I came to the conclusion that Gaia uh, is one, the, the biota, the but biosphere. But it's, it's too, the oneness and is it's too all, fast. And it's all in interplay. Yes, but that's and here's a question. Why don't we call it Father Nature? Thank you. <laughs> Same question for God. It's a very interesting question. Is God a woman and Gaia a, a, a man? So we've got more questions here at the mic. I'm just going to read one because it's close uh, to my heart as a, as a journalist and someone who's uh, gone. I went down to San Diego to, to uh, do a story on the Keeling Curve uh, and, and 400 ppm, and, and there was the great sound of silence after that story aired. And, and so this question is, is particular close to my heart from at Candace Callison. Um, if certainty does not lead to action, then what role for news and information in moving publics? Oh, that's a very important aspect, of course, because there is always this idea that uh, all of these questions should be protected against the pollution by the media, mm -hmm. uh, which is another way of, of rephrasing the argument that it should not be pollute, polluted by politics. But in fact, I mean, again, the climate is a magnificent case, is that there is an association, you have to choose between your scientists and also your media and also your politics. So what we are all really dealing with is, is, a, is, is a chain of association between a certain segment of the former scientific community, which in the case of the climate is actually the real relevant scientific community, against others who say they represent science and reason, and uh, you cannot, if you listen, for instance, to uh, uh, the climate sceptic and Fox News, you have, and, and then uh, the Tea Party, you have a completely different definition of what it is, the world in which you are in, than if you choose another uh, part, the IPCC, and then another news outlet, probably, I'm sure, CBC, I don't know, uh, and then uh, another political uh, parties. And here I will be Careful. So, the, 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 it's not, there is a science which would be much better if there were no journalists, because they deform everything and they all, always make a mess out of it. <laughs> uh, and then there is politics who should be kept outside of science, but there is a choice inside the sciences, inside the media, and inside the politics for a chain of association which is against another one. That's where the ecological conflicts are. You have to choose your every single element of a chain. On, on choosing is too much. Align yourself behind, because I'm not a specialist of climate. I can't decide, but I can decide on who, who is more partisan than who, who else. This is a Lipmanian point, which is very important. Politics is about choosing the less partisans. If you have the media, who allow you the detection of partisanship, of course. But if you lose the media, then you lose a, still another possibility of doing politics. So the media is absolutely crucial in that. So you mean the media is crucial in your, in your part? Have, have we lost the media in, in your view? Well, I think the, the media as, med, if the media goal is to allow the quick detection of partisanship fast, that's a pretty tough shibboleth to decide which media is because uh, it's not that we are objective, it's we are trying to detect partisanship faster. And if they don't help that, they are corrupted. And if you have corrupted media, corrupted politics and corrupted science, that's not a great moment. <laughs> Go ahead, you've been waiting patiently. Go ahead. Thank you. I'm actually thinking that my question might be very related to the one you just um, gave and that I was struck by the example of the cat in the basket on the seat. And um, 
you asked what sort of statement <coughs> Which is example, it? sorry? The cat in the basket on the seat. Oh, yes. Yes. The cat on the mat. And, yeah, exactly. And what kind of statement is this? And um, there were many points where I thought in your models, you gave what is to me, perhaps, because I'm a... Can you speak closer for the yeah, mic? Yeah. There were many points where I thought you gave a lot of power, actually, to the scientists in deciding what kind of statement this is. So in that particular example, I kept thinking, well, the person who decides what sort of statement this is is the person who is contemplating sitting on the seat. That is the person who will decide whether this is some distant fact that has no relevance to his actions, or whether this is some, this is meant to, t to advise an action. So whether it's a, um, I'm sorry, what were the terms, a um, constitutive or performative statement. So my question is, thinking of this, what do you see as the role of the people who are receiving the statements? in deciding what sort of scientific statements are being made. And perhaps you would say it's the media who are doing this. I don't know what other answers you may have. Well, I mean, if, if I understand right, the, the, this is in a way politics as usual. That is, we, we create assemblages which are called parties, on, which have, of course, dotted line. They are not as well defined as traditional political parties, which uh, align themselves uh, and, and form coalitions of, of people who, are, who remain outside the action. We, are, we don't have to become scientists ourselves. This is not the point. The point is to be able to rely on partisan detectable uh, instruments. Of course, one of them is the scientific literature itself, which is sometimes very readable, in fact. The IPCC is a typical case. The IPCC itself is a, it's a sort of parliament which has very strange mixtures because they are specialists plus state intervention uh, and themselves gathering data in a large parliament, in a way. So we, we already have some sort of political organization that do define in dotted line parties around all of those uh, issues, if I understood your question uh, right. So I'm, I'm not giving an enormous way to the scientists. The scientists are already engaged because of the IPCC, uh, in this case at least, because of the IPCC, uh, the UN uh, solution, in building around this issue a quasi-parliament. So we, how do we relate to that? Well, we relate to that in the same way as we do with lots of other issues. It's not a question of belief, because what we do is, is, is trying to be passionately objective about it, I'm not asking, they are not asking me to believe in what they do. It's not a question of belief. They ask me to align myself behind them if they can show they are less partisan than the others. And that's, I think, a, a sort of reasonable way of answering uh, the question of what the scientists expect from us and what we, we expect from the scientists. But the problem is that the scientists themselves are divided by the, like killing himself, by the, the, um, the reaction of their peers who say, you are not doing science, you are too passionate about it. So then we are completely confused because we thought that if you don't speak in the completely detached way, the cat is on the mat, in a sort of Dr. Spoke or Mr. Spoke uh, voice, yeah. the cat is on the mat, you are not a scientist anymore. And my argument is to say, no, be passionate, interested, and thus objective about the fact that matters, but they are dividing lines. Tell it. You are accused of being a lobby. Well, fine. Let's, let's display the lobby that you are representing. Let's count the money. The D-Smoke blog I mentioned, which I'm going to meet, I'm going to meet these people tomorrow, they do an excellent job of that. They, they display the lobbies of those who are actually uh, climate deniers. Well, the others, one should do exactly the same. Give, give, give your interest, give your money. Tell, tell how much money you earn. What are your interests? Why are you always playing this game as being disinterested? Who, 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 which good science has ever been produced by disinterested and non-passionate people?
Thanks for, thanks for your question. How are you holding up? We've got lots more. Doing okay? Well, depends on how long it would last. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Uh, that was actually a, a perfect segue into my question, and, and thank you, uh, Professor Latour, for your uh, presentation. My name is Connor Douglas, um, and it, my question has to do with a kind of lack of uh, political economic analysis of the kind that you just touched on, and I can appreciate what you're trying to do in terms of philosophically uh, explaining in the, in the face of what seems to be certainty, why is there not action? Wouldn't a kind of a political economic analysis say that, well, there might very well be certainty, but because of vested, you know, because, in, what? In, be, because of vested interests around essentially, you know, the fossil fuel industry, this is why action is not taken. And so um, would be a kind of complementary analysis to the, to, the, to the one that you offer. No, no, absolutely. I, I just say I'm, you, I'm sort of picking up one of the thing, which is the conceptual, a conceptual difficulty and of course, uh, many people are doing excellent work about the sort of socioeconomic uh, background of the climate deniers. But I would, I would add, it's good to do it on both sides. Sure. Because then, then there is, as long as it's done on only on one side, there is this idea that if science were purified from all these uh, bad guys, science would go straight and if, again, everyone would agree about it. No, I think it's... It, it's at the time where we are, it's more interesting to state the interest everywhere. So again, I'm a great fan of Walter Lippmann, I'm sorry. Uh, this is a Lippmann sentence again, that everyone should be flying under one's own color. Not hide behind the idea that general interest or science, because science capital S, because then it gets confused. Let's state what your interests are on both sides. And then, since we have to align ourselves behind a segment of the scientific community, a segment of the media, and a segment of politics and industry, well, we'd better draw those chains, those effectively, those parties, quick. So I agree with you. No, of course, it's not, it's not contradictory at all. It's complementary, as you said. But, but, but again, I mean, if, if, would that not then account for the lack of action in the face of yes, it more, does. Or, less, more yeah. or less scientific certainty? It, it, it's, it's made for that. Right. Skepticism plus lots of money. <laughs> that, that, that has been amazingly successful. Thank you. That's, I agree. Good. Thank you, sir. And we'll go over to this mic, and then I'll read an email question, and then we'll be back to this mic. Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, so I suppose someone of a segue. Um, do you think there are certain... Um, I, I don't hear you. Sorry. Sorry. Hello. <laughs> Um, do you think that there are certain socioeconomic backgrounds that would be better agents to realize a state wherein nature is the third party, therefore a state at peace, um, as opposed to where nature is not a party and is a state at war? Or, and in that, is nature in itself, in this case, embedded with certain moral, ethical, and ideological constraints and codes that are created by specific groups, as in like an economic elite or an ideological elite? I, I didn't understand. <laughs> okay. what, what was the argument? <laughs> I'm just, I'm basically asking, um, do you think that there are certain economic and ideological constraints that would disallow certain members to be agents in a state where nature is the third party in a state at peace? to realize that? I'm not sure. Um, what, what, nature is not a third party. Right. At the time of the, I mean, in the Möbius strip, which I mentioned, uh, we live in a situation where the, the very allusion to nature basically doesn't carry any agreement on anything. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is true also of genes, as much as it is on many other things. And, and this lack of agreement can be seen as, as, as a failure because the science is perverted by lots of other things, or as, <laughs> as a great advance, I mean, we are divided of course, on that, uh, because precisely nature will no longer be used as a third party. So I think that's what changed a lot. Naturalization, naturalization doesn't mean any 
thing. So in the three great virtue of science, which is out, it's out, it talks about things which are outside, objective, and unified. It's not outside, at least for those part of science, it's inside. It is uh, not unified, and it is objective, but objective in a very strange way. It's objective as matters of concern, and not as matters of fact. And that's, that's a shift. So we can use the word ideologies, uh, of course, but I, think, I don't think it captures the, the situation, if I understood the question, which I'm not sure. Right. Uh, Thank you. Thanks very much for your question. And this is the equivalent of the Jaws theme here. Uh, they're, they're playing it. We've got a couple minutes left. Do I have time for one more question, Janice? Yeah, okay, one more. So one more question. Thanks very much, guys. And, and thank you all to, to all of you who tweeted in at, at hashtag WallX and to the couple that, that emailed in. Uh, here's our last question. Thank you very much, Dr. Latour. Um, I'm wondering in the time between politics of nature in which you elaborate a really wonderfully complex politics for the non-human and the metaphorical and political shift to civil war, what happens to the non-human under that metaphorical and political banner of civil war? <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, the Anthropocene has made the argument which we developed in politics of nature, I say we because it's a science study, it's a general physics, um, much more easy, so to speak. Because when I was writing politics of nature, I had to convince people that non-humans were involved into politics. Well, <laughs> now you don't need to make the point. Everyone understands that. Uh, so in a way, uh, now the next step is, okay, but it, is it a politics where there is a referee or politics without a referee? And then the question, and that's related to the question of Gaia before, the question is to decide under which uh, power we now handle this question of the non-humans. And that's a very tricky, uh, very, very tricky question actually, which is connected to a book by Schmidt uh, called The Nomos of the Earth, which is a very interesting book if you listen to it with ecology in mind, which of course he was not, uh, he was not thinking of ecological conflicts at the time, which is uh, what sorts to sum it, to put it in terms of Gaia, what sort of power, of, of, of sort of, of, of resisting power uh, is Gaia? So that, all the questions of, of non-human are still very interesting, and of course I would use the term, but now, so to speak, it, it has become common sense. We, at the time of the Anthropocene, the human-non-human -human connection, which triggers so much sort of passion among sociologists uh, 20 years ago, is now completely moot. But now the question is, okay, but yes, if, there is, if they are sort of connected in many different local assemblages, what sort of is there? I mean, maybe it's anarchy, as one of the questions was, which is a very important question. Or is it possible to think of a state? But what would be the state of which one of the power, one of the authority would be Gaia? And that's, of course, a question which has been uh, through the whole anthropological literature um, around the question of other powers. But it's very odd to ask the question now in terms of a globe. And all of literature of anthropology uh, takes an urgency which we didn't have before. So thank you for your question. Thanks for your question. And thank you all for your questions. There's lots more of them, um, which means that we may have to have you back again, uh, but only if you get carbon credits. I come uh, by boat. <laughs> a round of applause for Dr. Bruno Lister. Thank you. So let me just <clears throat> Let me just close off the evening by thanking Dr. Latour for both the thoughtful and thought-provoking presentation, thanking uh, Duncan McHugh for facilitating the Q&A. I want to thank the Vogue staff and the staff at the Peter Wall Institute for Advanced Studies who, of course, have helped put on all of this, CBC and Georgia Strait for sponsoring with us, and uh, most of all, you for coming and joining this conversation. Thank you so very much.